for those of you who are here, um, the last couple of weeks, you'll know that we have been focusing on the uh, counting of the Omer, a uh, Seferit Omer uh, in Hebrew. And once again, I do want to uh, thank Pastor Charles for his uh, teachings on the counting of the Omer and also for the study chart that he designed for us to follow uh, each week. And by the way, there are still copies out there on the foyer table. Remember, seven weeks in all, plus one day for the season of counting the Omer. And those study charts uh, include seven major divine attributes of God, one divine attribute of God for each of the seven weeks. And then secondly, uh, our own personal reflection of that attribute. And thirdly, the fruit of the Spirit from Galatians chapter 5 that is connected with it. And uh, for those of you who have been counting the Omer and following uh, these designated divine attributes, if you will, you know that this past week, which was the second week of counting the Omer, uh, highlighted the divine attribute of God's justice, God's justice, which reflects in that second category, disciplined justice, that should be our own personal reflection of that attribute, a disciplined justice. And the fruit that's connected with it is the fruit of self-control. Now, I'm sorry Pastor Charles is not in here to hear this, but you can tell him later, that just as Pastor Charles took some liberty last week in combining <laughs> the nine fruits of the Spirit from Galatians 5 into seven categories, I, too, will take some liberty this week, and I'm going to combine God's judgments with God's disciplined justice and also adding divine decisions, which also reflect the aspect or the fruit of self-control. I want to repeat that. Today, I want to combine God's divine judgments with God's divine uh, disciplined justice and divine decisions, which also reflect the aspect of self-control. And perhaps we can glean from God's nature and make it our nature, especially as believers in the Messiah, Yeshua, who are also created in the image of God. Amen? Amen. Now, the message today is going to be somewhat different than uh, other messages, and I just want to share my heart with you that as I was seeking the Lord for the teaching, I, of course, looked at the designated you know, Torah portion and from Leviticus 9 through Leviticus 11, and right away what pops out is the dietary laws from Leviticus chapter 11. Everybody loves that subject. <laughs> but, you know, you, we have plenty of teachings on that in the Judaica. And I believe that will be covered in the uh, IMJ, Introducing Messianic Judaism classes. So I sought the Lord, and, and He said no. He said, Jeremy, Remember what you said to the congregation is that what we highlight here is godly character. There are many who are big on end time prophecy and, and other subjects, but the Lord has always put it on my heart that to develop godly character in God's people. Because in Him we live and move and we have our being. And so the Lord told me that he was going to show me something new each week 
as we look at the different divine attributes of God, and that I was to pass this on to you. Now the Hebrew word for this week connected with justice is the Hebrew word mishpat. Everyone say mishpat. mishpat. And mishpat has many meanings such as a verdict, a verdict which could be favorable or unfavorable, divine law, discretion, and ordinance, or uh, in the plural for ordinances it would be mishpatim which actually is uh, the title of one of the designated Torah portions um, that is found in Exodus chapter 21, verse 1 through Exodus 24, verse 18. Now the word mishpat is derived from the Hebrew root word shafat. Everyone say shafat. shafat. Which also has many meanings, such as to judge or to pronounce sentence, meaning to pronounce sentence for or against or to vindicate or to punish. Shafat also means to govern, to litigate, or to avenge. And from this root Hebrew word shafat comes other words still with, with similar meanings, such as they sound like shafat, they're an offshoot of it. Shafita, which means judgment. Shoftim, which means judges, and that actually is also a title of a designated Torah portion. In Deuteronomy 16, verse 18 through Deuteronomy 21, verse 9. And then there is also the word shofet, which means justice. So as you can see, all of these uh, Hebrew words are connected in meaning, them all coming from that root word, shafat. Now obviously, God's judgments, His verdicts, His laws, His ordinances, and all the above, comes from decisions, divine decisions that he makes. And the word for decision in Hebrew is charutz, which comes from the root word charatz, which again, his divine decisions reflect his disciplined justice and self-control. So let's see if we can capture some of this as we go through the scriptures and again, I want to add that today's message is definitely more heart knowledge than head knowledge. You know, head knowledge is good, but heart knowledge is better. So let's turn, please, to Genesis chapter 1. Yeah. 
I had a few others last night, but I thought of this one this morning. He could have created us in the image of the blob. <laughs> How many of you remember that movie? <laughs> But hallelujah and hallelujah, God created us in his very own image. Praise God. Now, let's go to Genesis 2, verse 18. And the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. So God saw that it was not good for man to be alone. So what does he do? He creates a woman for man to make it good. Adding in verse 24 that they shall be one flesh echad in Hebrew. So as you can see here, all of God's first decisions in the Bible were good. They were favorable. Because God is good. Now, as we all know, the enemy took what God meant for good and he turned it into evil by enticing Adam and Eve to sin provoking God's next decision of judgment. Let's read Genesis 3, beginning with verse 14. So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, you are cursed more than all cattle, and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go, and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed, he shall bruise your head, you shall bruise his heel. To the woman he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In pain you shall bring forth children, your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. And then to Adam he said, Because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree, of which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of it, cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. So now everything that God created to be good was now forced into judgment. Now in reality though, remember we're looking also at the reflection of disciplined justice. In reality, it was a disciplined justice which also included the aspect of self-control because the punishment could have been a lot worse. You know, God could have just right then and there destroyed the heavens, destroyed the earth and mankind all together. He could have just said, forget about it, and then started all over. But he didn't do that, did he? No. He actually allowed Adam to live to be 930 years old. Also of interest, God could have destroyed the serpent, the devil, right then, once and for all, but he didn't. And there was a reason. He reserved that final judgment for later. So this was a disciplined judgment. Now the point of all this is that God's first decisions in the early chapters of the Bible, they were all good. They were all favorable. They were all positive. And they were all for life itself. And that in itself should show us the very nature of God. See, he sets the example. And that's why he says later in the Torah, he says, choose life that you and your descendants may live. That's why Melech David says in Psalm 30, verse 5, his favor is for life. And that's why Yeshua said in Mark chapter 12, verse 27, he is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. Amen. Hallelujah. It was only when God was provoked that he had to make that second choice of judgment, but his first choice is always for life. And we need to reflect that ourselves in our own lives, in our own words, in our own actions, because again, we are created in the image of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So that means that we need to speak life into every situation. Proverbs 18, verse 21 says that the power of life and death are in the tongue. So we need to speak life into every situation, just as God did in the beginning. We need to speak healing into every situation. We need to speak blessings into every situation and not 
curses. You know, because everything that we say, everything that comes from our lips, it lives on in the spirit realm. It has a ripple effect once it departs from your mouth. It's causing things to happen. Now we know, and this is good news, that once a blessing is imparted, it cannot be reversed. Amen? You've seen that. And it's true that a curse can be reversed. God can reverse a curse. But why speak one at all? Remember that God spoke creation and us into existence and he called it very good. And as his creation created in his name, Shouldn't we be doing the same as the B'nai Elohim, as the children of God? Yes. First John chapter 3, verse 1 says, Behold what manner of love God has bestowed upon us, that we should be called the children of God. Now let's turn please to Genesis chapter 6. Continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved, underline the word grieved, in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing, and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Now this makes a big difference because this is going to lead to a disciplined justice for mankind because Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Now obviously here God is going to destroy the earth with a flood due to the wickedness of man. But let me ask you something. Is he going to totally destroy the earth and mankind? No. No, no he's not. Because Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord, and through Noah, Noah's sons and their wives, and this is interesting, eight people in all, and eight is the number of new beginnings. Through them, God is going to repopulate the earth after it goes through what? After it goes through a cleansing, or meaning after it goes through the mikvah of the flood. Even though God was grieved in his heart, it says in verse 6, he exercises a disciplined judgment for the earth, not destroying it completely, but looking for a way to cleanse it, to redeem it, and bring new life to it, to give it a new beginning. And that is a good word for us today. Because often, when someone deeply hurts us, <coughs> causing us to grieve in our heart, as God grieved, well then we want to see that person or that group of persons destroyed completely. We want to see them utterly fall. But that's not God's way. Somebody say, that's not God's way. Not, not God's way. His way is to bring healing. His way is to bring cleansing and to bring redemption, and to bring new life to every situation. Hallelujah. Isn't that what he did for each one of us? Yes. Through the Messiah, Yeshua, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, tells us if anyone is in the Messiah, the old is gone, the new has come. Yeah. A brand new creation. Amen. Now this also is reflected later on in Genesis 8 and 9, when Noah and his family come out of the ark, what does Hashem say to them? He now says, be fruitful and multiply the earth. He also says, never again will I destroy the earth with a flood after 
he smelled that pleasing aroma of the sacrifice of the clean bird that was offered up by Noah. And by the way, that pleasing aroma in the Torah, it also points toward Yeshua because Paul says in Ephesians 5, 2, that Yeshua offered himself up as a sweet fragrance to God. I am convinced that everything written in the Torah in one way or another points toward Yeshua, the Torah made flesh. And then God set the rainbow in the sky, sealing the covenant. So what do we see here? Even in the unfavorable judgment of the flood for mankind, we still see God's disciplined justice and self-control in not destroying it altogether. Let's turn to Genesis chapter 22. binding of Isaac, known as the Akita. Let's read the first two verses. Now it came to pass, after these things, that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, Hineni, here am I. And then he said, Take now your son, your only son, Yitzchak, Isaac, who you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So obviously, God made a decision to test Abraham, to see if Abraham would sacrifice his only son as God himself would do on that very same mountain 2,000 years later. And there's a lesson here. Isaac was the promised son. Isaac was the son of the covenant that Abraham had waited many years for. Probably his most, most precious thing to him. And what was most precious to Abraham was now being asked to be sacrificed to God. How would we react if we were asked to do the same? I thought about this and I realized that sometimes we too, we need to put our children on the altar and release them to God. Not physically putting them on wood and lighting it, of course not, but you know a lot of us, our children are so precious to us and we love them and we always want to help them and we always want to uh, help them financially or whatever we can do. Sometimes we get in the way of what God wants to do with them. And we need to just put them on the altar and release them to the Lord so God's perfect will can be done in their lives. Anyway, how would we react if we were asked to give up someone who was so precious to us, or something that was so precious to us, and I know we could all fill in the blanks there. Now, I believe that God already knew the outcome. I believe he already knew what Abraham would do, because a few chapters earlier in Genesis 18, verse 18 and 19, the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am doing? For I have known him to do righteousness and justice, that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has spoken to him. You see, God was not going to hold back those covenant blessings to Abraham. But after seeing Abraham's obedience, God did hold back Abraham's hand from killing Isaac. And what do we see there? This was a disciplined justice, and through the holding back of Abraham's hand, we also see the element of self-control. Divine self-control. And as we all know, God then provided a lamb caught in the bushes, pointing to Yeshua, the Lamb of God, that God would provide 2,000 years later on that same mountain. 
And so underlying all of this, underlying God's disciplined justice, Hashem was basically saying this to Abraham, in my disciplined justice, Abraham, you don't have to sacrifice your son. I'll sacrifice mine. Let's turn to Exodus chapter 10. Now the Lord said to Moses, Go into Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart and the hearts of his servants, that I may show these signs of mine before him, and that you may tell in the hearing of your son and your son's son the mighty things that I have done in Egypt. How many of you were at the Passover Seder a couple of weeks ago? Remember that we, uh, we, we tell the, the story of the departure from Egypt each year at the Seder, because the more one tells of the departure from Egypt, the more God is to be praised. And this is obviously in obedience to what he says here. Let's read on. And my signs, which I have done among them, so that you may know that I am the Lord, so that you may know that I am the Lord. Highlight that. Now, obviously, God's judgment, looking at judgment, is now coming upon Egypt through the ten plagues and the subsequent deliverance of the children of Israel from Pharaoh and from the Egyptians. But one might ask, why did God wait 400 years to deliver his people, especially after seeing, seeing their suffering? And hearing their cry for so long. Why did he do that? Why, you ask? Why? Why? Well, first of all, we can certainly see the aspect of self-control on God's part for waiting so long, especially uh, after seeing the bitterness of slavery of his chosen people, who actually his chosen people were his bride-to-be. His heart must have been grieving all those years. But this is going to be a disciplined justice with self-control. You see, God's judgment doesn't always come right away. There was a necessary dispensation of time for the pride in Pharaoh's heart to swell up. Pharaoh even said, who is this God that I should obey him? There was a necessary dispensation of time for the gods of Pharaoh and the Egyptians to exalt themselves against the Almighty. There was a necessary dispensation of time for the whole house of Egypt to put their trust and even boast about their gods. And then when things finally had fermented to the Lord's satisfaction, that's when the God of Israel struck Egypt, saying that you may know that I am the Lord. Amen. You see, sometimes God allows the enemy to win a few rounds so that his knockout punch is more spectacular in the end. Amen? Amen. Amen. And that tenth round knockout punch was the tenth play, and it was the blood of the Lamb. Somebody say, there's power in the blood. Say it again. There's power in the blood. There's power in the blood of the Lamb. Hallelujah. And by the way, that's also why he didn't destroy the devil completely in the garden. Because that's going to come later in the final round, according to the book of Revelation. And I guarantee you, it too will be something spectacular. Now, there might be another prophetic reason why God waited so long for the deliverance from Egypt. 
There are many people today who have been in bondage to the Pharaoh of this world for so long, and you can be sure it also grieves the heart of God. But God in His mercy, He still patiently waits for these lost souls to come out of Egypt, for them to come under the blood before they are handed over to destruction. God even said to Moses in Exodus 34, verse 6, when he was describing his very own nature, he said, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and in truth. Amen. You see, it's God's will that none should perish, but that all would come to repentance and receive his son, Yeshua. The blood of the Lamb is ready to be appropriated to all the lost souls of today just as it was for the children of Israel when they left Egypt. Let's turn, please, to Exodus chapter 32. And in Exodus 32, we read of the incident of the golden calf. We know the background to the story, the people, they got tired of waiting for Moses to come down from the mountain. And so led by Aaron, they build a golden calf. And then God passes a very severe judgment that he is going to destroy the whole nation of Israel in the wilderness. But then Moses intercedes with God on behalf of the people. We're in Exodus 32. Let's read in verse 11. Then Moses pleaded with the Lord his God and said, Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians speak and say, Look, he brought them out to harm them, to kill them in the mountains and to consume, consume them from the face of the earth? So Moses pleads, turn from your fierce wrath and relent, underline the word relent, from this harm to your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, to whom you swore by your own self and said to them, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven and all this land that I have spoken of I give to your descendants and they shall inherit it forever. And upon hearing this, the Lord relented, underline relented from the harm which he had said he would do to his people. Now the Hebrew word used for relent in both verse 12 and verse 14 is the word nachem, nachem, which actually means repent or repented. Now that's kind of hard for us to imagine God repenting of anything, since the word repent is connected with sin, and there is no sin in God. God does not sin, period. So there's got to be an explanation here. The rabbis actually call this an anthropomorphism. Want to try and say that? <laughs> Anthro, anthropomorphism. Anthropomorphism, which basically means describing an act of what is not human, in this case divine, but using human terms. So a more accurate translation probably would be that God changed his purpose of the evil that he was going to do to his people. And in the original text it does read ra, reads hara'a, which is evil. God changed his purpose of the evil he was going to do to his papal people. But in either case, God changed his mind due to the intercession of Moses. And if God, and listen carefully, if God changed his mind, that would mean that he exercised, what? Self-control, which is a fruit of the Spirit. That's kind of different. You mean God has the fruit of the Spirit? Yeah. Of course He has the fruit of the Spirit. 
This would make perfect sense since 2 Corinthians 3.17 says, The Lord is the Spirit. Now furthermore, because God changed his mind due to the intercession of Moses, is proof that he does listen and act upon our prayers. James 5.16 confirms the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Now let me clear this up. God doesn't change. His nature doesn't change. God doesn't change, says the prophet Malachi. But God does change, sometimes, his mind. I thought of a perfect example. Remember King Hezekiah? The prophet Isaiah came to him and said, get your things in order. You're going to die. Hezekiah wept bitterly before the Lord. Before Isaiah even got out of the house, God told him to go back. Here's what the Lord says. He's not going to kill you. He's going to add 15 more years to your life. Did God who changed his mind. Now, perhaps God was over-emotional at first after the incident of the golden calf. God has emotions. Did you know that? God has emotions. We've already seen how he grieves. We know that he is a jealous God. We know that Yeshua, God in the flesh, wept. He wept over Jerusalem. He wept over uh, the tomb of Eliezer, Lazarus. We know that Yeshua rejoiced which I believe means that Yeshua laughed. Do you ever think about Yeshua laughing? Well, what a great laugh he must have. We know Yeshua got angry at times. He overturned the tables of money. He rebuked the Pharisees for their hypocrisy often. So it would appear that the Lord exercised self-control and changed his mind from an emotional decision to a more disciplined justice in the end, in the golden calf incident. But as you read on in verse 28, it says that 3,000 of the Israelites perished that day instead of the whole nation, and that is because sin does always have consequences. But listen, that same number of Jews, 3,000, according to Acts chapter 2, were saved, they went into the mikvah, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit after Peter preached the gospel. And there too we see the redeeming hand of God. So what can we learn from this? If God can change his mind from hot anger to extending mercy, then we should also. You know, if it's good enough for God, it should be good enough for us. Can somebody say amen to that? Amen. And furthermore, Moses often interceded on behalf of the people before God, but Yeshua is always interceding for us at the right hand of the Father. Now, Yeshua's teachings on this subject are many. But let's look at a few. And let's remember that Yeshua's teaching was called Keter Torah in Hebrew, meaning the crown of Torah. And on the subject of judgment, he tells us plainly in Matthew 7, Judge not that you not be judged, for with what judgment you use, you will be judged. In Matthew 5, it says, Love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. And then again in Matthew 7, before you take the speck out of your brother's eye, take the plank out of your own. So very plainly, Yeshua teaches us, very clear, on the surface, do not judge or else you will be judged. But let's move on to some of his deeper teachings 
and his own, own personal examples that are more consistent with what we've heard so far in the teaching, more consistent with the divine flavor of God's teaching for us today, such as the prodigal son in Luke chapter 15. Let's turn there, please. Luke chapter 15. And as we're turning there, we know the background to this story where a man who represents God had two sons, the younger, asked for his inheritance, which he squandered in a distant land, a foreign land. But eventually he came to his senses. He returned home hoping, hoping to be treated like a hired servant, believing he would no longer be treated like his son by his father. Let's pick it up in verse 20. And he, meaning the prodigal son, arose and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion, and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight, and am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring out the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet, and bring the fatted calf here and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. Now by all rights, Again, we're looking at God's judgments, his discipline, justice, self-control. By all rights, the father should have disowned him, especially because of the culture of that time. This rebellious son had squandered a large part of the family inheritance. He had defiled himself by feeding and probably eating with swine, with pigs. He violated the Torah. He brought shame to the family reputation. And by all rights, the father should have given him some good Jewish guilt. <laughs> should have given him some good Jewish guilt, saying, what's the matter, you didn't like the blue sweater? <laughs> Inside joke. <laughs> or did the father say, you schlep? You shlemiel? You shlemazel? You schmenter? You schnook? You schmo? Did he say any of those things? No. And here is where we see the divine justice of the Father, of God. Because all he cared about that his son was home safe and sound. All he cared about was that now he could wrap his arms around him and tell him how much he loved him. All he cared about was, was though he was lost, he came back to where he belonged. And this is how our Heavenly Father, we should never take His love for granted. This is how our Heavenly Father feels about each one of us. All He cares about is that we are at home, safe and sound. All He cares about is that He can wrap His arms around us and tell us how much He loves us. All He cares about is that we are not lost, but we are found. All He cares about is that we are not dead, but that we are alive in the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. And this is, if you go back to the beginning, this is the same God who created us in His own image in the beginning to be His children, whom He called very good. You know, I believe, as the Spirit is leading right now, that we need to, as the children of God, let's just stand up. Stand up. 
And let's just verbalize our love for God. Just tell Him how much you love Him. You know, it's by the Holy Spirit living inside of us that we cry out, Abba, Father. Somebody cry out, Abba, Father. Abba, Father. Father, I love you. I bless you. I praise you. I thank you, Lord. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your divine discipline for me. Thank you that though I was lost, you found me. Thank you, Lord, though I was dead. You caused me to be alive. Yes. Thank you, Lord, that though I was in darkness, you brought me into your marvelous light. Thank you, Lord, Thank you, Lord that you didn't abandon me. You didn't leave me in my sin. But by your mighty right hand, you brought me out of my own Egypt. Yes. And you set my feet high upon a rock. Abba, Father, I love you. And Lord, you know I'm 64 years old, but I'm still your child. And I still love you with all my heart and with all my soul and with all of my strength. Hallelujah. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. And his mercy endures forever. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. And if you love the Lord, give him a great big clap off. Thank you. Thank you. Hallelujah. Okay, we can be seated for just a few more moments because I want to look at one final example that Yeshua sets for us in the Garden of Gethsemane before his crucifixion in the Garden of Gethsemane, where Yeshua sweats great drops of blood, knowing that he's going to be tortured, knowing he's going to be crucified, knowing, knowing he's going to be handed over to sinful men, where he takes the cup of judgment upon himself, and where he says in agony, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass me by. Then he paused. For a moment. And then he made a divine decision. saying, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. You know, he could have, at any time, he could have called down a legion of angels at any time to rescue him. But he had <coughs> self-control. He was crucified, he died, he shed his blood for the sins of the world, and now divine justice has been in place for all of us. Whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. Whoever does not believe in him will face a final verdict. Hebrews 9 adds, For it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. Now, you don't have to turn there, but let me read to you from the book of Revelation, chapter 20, beginning with verse 10. It says, The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are. And there you have it, the final knockout punch. 
reserved for the devil in the end. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. And then I saw a great white throne, and whom, him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. You know, Yeshua, he suffered greatly. But God has not made it difficult for us to be saved. Yeah. Romans 10, verse 9 says, If you confess with your mouth that Yeshua is Lord, and if you believe in your heart that He is risen from the dead, which He is, then you will be saved. And so ultimately, we are all going to have our name written in one book or another, the book of life or the book of death. And ultimately, we are all going to spend eternity in one place or another, in heaven or in hell. anyone listening think about all of this and then make the right decision Amen let's all stand please let's have the worship team come back up
here today and you've never asked Yeshua, Jesus, into your heart, the altar is open. Please come down. We'll pray with you. Or you can see me after the service. I'll be happy to pray with you. For those of you who have other needs or just want to come down once more and just worship the Lord. Thank Him for His great salvation and His mercy and His divine justice for all of us.
Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And may the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Perfect peace, Beshem Yeshua HaMashiach, the Sar Shalom, the Prince of Peace. That thy way may be known upon the earth, and thy salvation amongst all of the nations. Amen and amen. God bless you all. You are dismissed from the sanctuary. Let's go downstairs for some good food and fellowship.